Hi, Drew. It's Andy here. Can you hear us okay? Hey, yeah, we're doing fine. Great to be with you. I'm sorry I'm not there with you in person. No problem at all, Captain Cernan. Um, I've got Mike Fall here. Um, we're probably going to shout closer to the mic on the laptop. Um, we're going to ask you a few questions. Who said Scott, my man? <laughs> <laughs> Um, we're going to, uh, Mike's going to open in the questions to talk about the film that we've just watched which was tremendous and then we're going to invite some uh, participants up from the audience to ask you a question if that's okay with you Captain Sermon. That's great, I'd be glad to talk to anyone that really is interested. By the way, I just got back from Australia and uh, it was a great, great visit but you guys all talk just enough alike that I can't understand anybody. <laughs> Thank goodness I've got Mike here to translate for me. <laughs> so, uh, Gene, yeah, I, I've lived in America for about 30 years, um, and my wife Rhonda is from Kentucky, but she never managed to teach me to speak American either. So, uh, you're going to have just as much trouble with me as you will with any of the other Scots in this, in this theater. Hey, are folks in Scotland aware that, uh, that Mark Stewart? Is actually from Scotland. He's, he's our. He was our. He produced a film, and I know they know who his dad is. Jackie Stewart, the famous race car driver. Yes, they do. And, Gene, I, I want to jump in here and just tell you what just happened. Uh, you may not know it, but maybe you do. Uh, we just watched a, a movie about this hero, a guy called Gene Cernan, who was the last man on the moon, and. Uh, I just want to say, uh, and, and you've got Drew right next to you there, I don't know what he feels about this, but I always thought you Apollo guys were just amazingly uh, different from people like me. And uh, I just have to say, I was really touched and uh, impressed by the honesty and the, uh, the intuition and the, the reflection you put into that movie. And uh, I've got to tell you, I think you, you reassured me that you're a human being just like I am, so thank you very much. Hey, that, that was a whole intent. I actually spoke once I got into it. I really didn't want to do it. I was afraid. Who did that want to see a movie about me? But once I got into it, I, I, a, a friend of mine told me, Gene, it's not about you. It's about a young with a dream from any town, USA, any town, Europe, any town, Australia. And, and he said, that's the real story, it's not you, it's about. So now I've been in a mode, particularly since people seem to like it, of saying, you know, we're not those big super kicks coming out of the sunset, uh, which is, you said it a minute ago, we all put our pants up one leg at a time. I wanted my friends, my family, uh, who live that part of life with me, to share in their thoughts so people out here would, would better understand the kind of people we were. And hopefully those kids, 15 to 22, uh, or thereabouts, uh, might be inspired. Might, the dreams of the day are the doers of tomorrow, and God knows we need doers. And if we can inspire those kids to do things that they were unwilling to try, if you don't try, they don't never know how good they can be. And we need those kids in the next generation. And if, if I leave something on this planet, uh, I hope that's what it's all about. Well, those are fantastic words, uh, Gene. I'm going to open up the, uh, the questions to the audience, if that's all right with you. Hey, Mike, that sounds good. I just have one request. Um, maybe while we're talking and you're not, if you could mute your side of the mic because I'm getting a little bit of kickback, and then we'll sort of do the same here. So we'll listen to your questions, and then uh, if you could mute your mic uh, when we're chatting, that would help with our uh, feedback. We'll go. We'll do. And we'll do that. We'll try. Captain Sermon, it's Andy Campbell here. I would like to introduce you to the leader of Renfrewshire Council, uh, Mark and McMillan, to ask the very first question of yourself. Uh, Councillor McMillan. Thank you. Uh, Captain Sermon, it is my absolute privilege to be able to speak to you. Hopefully, you can understand me. Um, in the film earlier, 
we held and, and watched, and watched you watching President John F. Kennedy and quoting George Mallory and that great explorer. And can I say that you embody everything um, that there is in that quote and the quote of John F. Kennedy. I'm sure um, your country and that president would be um, eternally grateful to you and very proud. The simple question I have, and it is particularly difficult to think of a, a clever question or a, a, um, to ask you, but you were the last man to walk on, on the moon. When the next man or woman walks on the moon, what do you want them to complete? I, I, I got that question long there. Let, let, me, let me clear up something. I am not the last human being to walk on the moon. I'm the last human being to have left my footprints of Apollo, or the, perhaps the last human being to have left my footprints on the moon in the 20th century. But there are young men and young women. I don't know who they are. There are sons, there are, there are grandkids, and they're theirs, who are not going to only take us back to the moon to be the next human being, man or woman, and or to Mars, and quite frankly, I won't say it, but you're young enough. You may very well see those young kids take us to Mars are going to be the next one. So last is not, I, I don't relish the term or the time being, I'm the last. What I want them to do, you know, we only landed at, at six places. That's not very many considering, and the moon is, is big, whether you like to believe it or not. There's so much we can learn, so much potential, uh, uh, commercial potential on our own. And the questions we have yet to answer, is there ice in the South Pole? You know, can we live there long durations of time? Uh, and, and in addition, because I'm so adamant about going to Mars, it is God-given training station or point for us to practice what we need to know to live long durations and, and learn how we're going to make it on Mars for long periods of time. There's tremendous, all kinds of reasons, besides <laughs> a lot of people want to go back and see whether I really left my daughter's uh, <laughs> initials there, which I did. But uh, if I could go back, like you know, you've been so, you always want to go back and do the things you forgot to do. And there's a lot of things I forgot to do or say. If I had a chance, I'd go back in the morning. Great question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next question. My Jean and Michael. Um, I love the film. It's an excellent, excellent, excellent film. Um, when you were in space and when you walked on the moon, what was the most special memory for you? Without question, you know, stepping on the moon was a big deal for me because, well, the first steps have always been made since, you know, long before I got there. But I was somewhat an underdog in the space program. I didn't even apply when the time came. I'm one of the few guys standing around you that didn't go to test pilot school and I commanded a mission. So those first steps on the moon were important to me to prove that I was good enough. To, to be who I was, to do what I did. Very important. But I will tell you the memory that's everlasting in my mind, looking back at the earth. Uh, it mocked the colors of blues, of the oceans, of the whites, to the snow and the cloud. And this is tough to, tough to imagine. Surrounded by the blackest black, I didn't say darkness, blackest black you can conceive in your mind. What is it? Infinity? Uh, endlessness of space, endlessness of time, I don't know. But I promise you it exists, because I saw it with my own eyes. And the world did not tumble, it didn't move aimlessly, it, did, it moved with purpose and beauty through that endlessness uh, beyond our conception. Prove to me, prove to me that it did not happen by accident, that, that there is a creator above us all. Some some guy, you can dress him or call him by whatever name you want, but I tell you, I've been to the moon twice. I challenged that thought. I, I sat on God's front porch 
for three days of my life. That's the only way I can describe it, and I'll never forget it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks Next question. Well, I tell you what, I think we could have pushed the Defender on the Rover you're talking about. That, you know, <laughs> I'm the only car within 250,000 miles and there's no roadside assistance. <laughs> but uh, uh, it, the dust was, was overpowering and yes, we could have gone ahead. We would have found some way to cover that fender. It's like a, riding a bicycle on a rainy day without a fender and you, you, that, big, that water comes over the top. That's the way the dust was for us to kind of over all of our equipment and, and, then, and our equipment needed to look at the black sky to be cool. So it, would have, it did give us a problem. It would have continued to give us a problem. But I can promise you, I didn't go to the moon to come home earlier and not come home at all. We would have made it work. Thank you. I've got two more questions, um, Captain Sermon. So next question. Hi there, how are you? Um, you rode the Titan when you flew in Germany, and you rode the Saturn V twice on a, uh, on a pole. Which one gave the smoother ride? My second question, which links in. During staging, was it as violent in the capsule as it has been depicted in movies? Just like when you look at when you look at that Germany booster, what four hundred and twenty some odd thousand pounds of thrust, a couple of hundred feet tall, and then you look at that big Saturn five seven point five billion pounds of thrust, five hundred feet tall, and I had a chance to ride it twice or once at night. Let me tell you, riding that big old big old Saturn booster was something else. It, John Young called the first stage when it shot up to about four G's and then shut down. He calls it the great train wreck. <laughs> I've never been in a great train wreck, but that's, I can imagine the boat is on. Chimney was really smooth. Different propellant, different everything, shorter burn time, got us in a little toilet. That Saturn V had to get us to the moon and rough and rumble and it's very difficult to tell the difference between feeling noise and hearing noise. And I think we got both. And can you uh, repeat your second part of your question, please? The second part was, uh, during staging, was it as violent as it's depicted in the movies and in TV series? It, you know, we lifted off, we lifted off very slowly because the thrust was barely over the weight. So it didn't blow our face back. We barely moved until we got we got to the end of the, uh, uh, you know, about 15 seconds. If, if we lost an engine, we're coming back down. We got past that point, it was taking a deep breath. Uh, and, and uh, but it, the, the staging was violent. This big old, I mean, it's, heavy, it's big, it's moving at four and a half Gs, and when it shut down, it threw us against the panel, back again, forward again, Settles down, and the third, second stage started very slowly again. So, with a little bit of both. But that, those are good questions. It, it was worth the ride, though. Let me tell you, I do it again. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. One more question, Captain Sermon. Uh, 
I just, yeah, Jack and I had a uh, personality class going in. It's just the nature we were different. Uh, and of course, he was a scientist. He didn't fly. He was not a pilot. So our thinking was in little different directions. And besides, uh, my original co-pilot was a guy named Joe Engel, Air Force X-15 pilot. There's a big difference. But Jack and I got over our differences, and quite frankly, it was the right decision to make. He was a microgeologist, and and he looked at on the moon. He looked at the look picture. I was a observer. I'm an engineer. I'm a I'm a I'm a aviator. So I looked and said, Where did those mountains come from? Well, how did this begin? Where did it go? And so the geologists were able to put a big picture together between the little and the big, and, and it was extremely heavy. And quite frankly, from a political point of view, from a scientific view, he was the only scientist in the program, the last flight, and he should have flown, and he did one hell of a good job, I want to say that. Now, do we see him today? No, but that's the nature of the kind of people we are. You're welcome. Captain Sennon, I'm going to hand you over to Chris Barber um, in, in a second, but I just had one question myself. Um, we've got a, quite a few young people in the audience this evening. They're maybe a little shy to ask any questions. However, ISET are in town to help inspire the future generations. Do you have any words for our young people here this evening? Yeah, let me, let me just say that I think I opened this up, but I really wanted to dedicate uh, this film, if there's anything worthwhile in, in the film listening to, if you get a feeling of who we were, that we're no different than you, or your parents or grandparents, uh, that, that's, that's important to me. And don't let peer pressure overcome you. You have got opportunities in the future with the technology you've got at your, at your fingertips to do almost anything you want. And as I said earlier, if you don't try You'll never know how good you can be. My dad brought me up, and I never forget one thing he always said. He said, I don't care what, whether it's a classroom, whether it's on a sports field, or where it is, there's nothing anyone can ask of you than to do your best. And I think those words drove me on. As I said, I was an underdog, so I had to do a little bit better than the rest of them. But he said, you're not, remember, you're not going to be better than everyone at everything. But sooner or later, you are going to surprise yourself. How prophetic he was, because fate took me down that winding path, you know, from graduating college, about the time God created water, and uh, gave me an opportunity uh, and a challenge. And uh, I was willing to take the risk that went with it. And lo and behold, guess where it took me? I lived on the moon. And that's, it's, it's almost arrogant for me to stand here in front of you people and tell you I landed on the moon and lived on the moon. But it happens to be a fact of life. It's what our generation was able to do. And remember, it, we didn't think it was going to come out this way, but that's withstanding Apollo 13. Everyone, think about this. Everyone who went to the moon has come home to talk about it. And I think that's a testimonial to what we as nations of, of the free world could do if we put our mind and our heart to it. And when we go to Mars, folks, we're going together. Thank you. Chris Farmer. Hello, Gene. I mean, I, I say this totally genuinely that I think that uh, you and the other guys that walked on the moon represent the pinnacle of human achievement. And the only thing I have against that statement is that it was such a long time ago. And maybe people think that we, uh, that we can't improve and we can't go on, whereas in all other fields, maybe except for space travel, everything in the world and everybody's capabilities have improved. So in terms of how we've improved and what we're really capable of now, what's your view? 
of what we're capable of doing now? Yeah. Damn near anything, quite frankly. Uh, you know, when you look, we, I walked in the moon 43 years ago. Give me a break. <laughs> 43, these young kids, they got iPhones in their hand that they got a thousand times more capability than I had in my hands when I landed on the moon. I mean, I'm not saying that I was different than anybody else, but that's all we had. Look where we've come in 43 years. Look where we can go if we get those kids' attention, get them asking questions, get them curious and get them committed with, and inspired to do something different and exciting. And, and that's, I, I, I'll repeat it again, the dreamers of today are the doers of tomorrow. So you and I need to give those kids an opportunity to do what you, what you did in your life and what I did in my life. And it'll happen, I promise. Right, well, I'll just hand over to one of those kids right now. <laughs> oh, Gene, I wish I was one of those kids. I just want to say, uh, we're going to wrap it up now, Gene. Um, thank you very, very much for all the work you've done in serving the United States of America, uh, humanity, and telling your story in the movie. We really, really enjoyed it this evening, and we'd all like to give you a great big hand for all the work you've done. to be among you young kids. I'm 82 years old, everybody is young. And what you're doing, we were the pathfinders. Of, John Glenn was my pathfinder. Okay, maybe we were for years, but you are the pathfinders for those young kids that are trading behind you. And don't ever give up, don't ever stop, stay with them. Thank you, Gene.